We've talked about gases, which have no defined volume or shape, and liquids, which have a defined volume but no defined shape. Now we're moving on to solids, which have both a defined volume and shape. The individual molecules of a solid will have some degree of kinetic energy, but that amount of energy is insufficient to allow the molecules to move past each other. Broadly speaking, there are two main types of solids, crystalline and amorphous. Crystalline solids have an orderly arrangement of its constituent components, be they molecules, ions, or atoms. In many cases, this order is long range enough that we can visually see the ordering as regular faceted crystals. Salt, ice, and diamond are some examples of crystalline solids. Amorphous solids do not have long range order. Most rubbers and plastics, glass, and wax are examples of amorphous solids. Side note. You may have heard the myth that glass is a liquid that simply flows incredibly slowly. This is false. Glass is a solid. Solids can also be categorized based on how they are held together. Atomic solids are individual atoms held together only by London dispersion forces. The only known examples are the noble gases, because they are the only atom types that don't bond. These solids are rather exotic and don't form under anything close to standard conditions, so we won't be discussing them more here. Molecular solids like carbon dioxide, water, and naphthalene are held together only by intermolecular forces, not including ionic interactions. These can be quite weak, as in the case of carbon dioxide, or extremely strong, as in the case of hydrogen bonding of water. Because of the wide variety of molecular compounds, the properties of molecular solids can vary significantly as well. Their melting and boiling points tend to be higher than atomic solids, but less than ionic solids. And because they do not have mobile charge carriers, they tend to be electrical insulators. Ionic solids are, as you probably suspect, held together primarily by ion-ion interactions. Because these interactions tend to be quite strong, ionic compounds tend to have very high melting and boiling points. While aqueous solutions of ionic compounds and molten ionic liquids can conduct electricity because the ions themselves act as mobile charge carriers, ionic solids are typically electrical insulators because the ions are stuck in place. Ionic solids also tend to be extremely brittle, a fact we can understand quite readily simply from their structure. Imagine striking this crystal here, hard enough to displace the ions very slightly, just the width of a single atom. What used to be attraction-dominated ion-ion intermolecular forces is now repulsion-dominated, and the crystal shatters. Metallic solids follow a completely different paradigm. To understand why, let's take a look at electronegativities of representative covalent, ionic, and metallic structures. Covalent compounds are formed among the most electronegative elements. Now remember what electronegativity means. It is the strength with which elements hold on to bonding electrons. So for a covalent bond, you need both elements on the ends of the bond to have high electronegativities, meaning that the electrons are being held on to tightly by both atoms, forcing them to be shared between them. For ionic compounds, we have a mismatch between electronegativity. On one side, we have highly electronegative atoms, which steal electrons away from atoms with low electronegativity. For metallic solids, none of the atoms involved have high electronegativities, so all of the atoms only loosely hold on to their valence electrons. Let's think about what that means. Let's first look at the atomic core, which I'm defining to mean the nucleus and the core electrons, by which I mean all electrons other than the valence electrons. Now let's add in the valence electrons. Here I am showing a single valence electron per atom, which is true for the alkali metals, but the concepts we are developing will apply regardless of how many valence electrons the atoms involved have. Now, none of these electrons are being held particularly tightly by any of the atomic cores, so the valence electrons form, essentially, a diffuse sea of electrons. In covalent and ionic compounds, the valence electrons are localized because there are some highly electronegative elements holding them in place. But in a metallic solid, the electrons are delocalized, meaning that they are distributed pretty uniformly throughout the solid. Let's think about some of the implications of this. First, if the electrons are as delocalized as this model predicts, they should easily move through the bulk solid. That makes metals electrical conductors, because it is extremely easy to add electrons to one side of the solid and to pull others out of the other side, with the electrons in between just sloshing from one side to the other to compensate. 
Metals should also be good thermal conductors, because adding or removing kinetic energy to the electrons, which are held very loosely, should be easy. Metals are ductile and malleable. Unlike the ionic case we looked at earlier, it doesn't really matter where the cores are in a metal. Push them around a bit, and you still have a bunch of cores held together by an electron C. So you can beat metals into shape, draw them into wires, and generally form them as you wish. Metals have luster, meaning that they're shiny. When light hits their surface, it is easy for the electrons to absorb photons and then re-emit them, resulting in reflection. It's easy to imagine replacing some of the metal cores with different atoms, so we can, for example, mix copper and tin in almost any ratio to form bronze, copper and zinc in almost any ratio to form brass, silver and copper to make sterling silver. We can even mix in small amounts of a more electronegative element, like carbon, to change the properties of the metal, turning iron, in this case, into steel. Finally, let's return briefly to covalent bonding. There are some elements of, or groups of elements that can bond to themselves or each other in repeating patterns. Carbon is the king of this behavior. Let's start by looking at sp3 hybridized carbon, which is tetrahedral like methane. If we have each carbon covalently bound to four other carbon atoms, we get a network of carbon that extends in all three dimensions. This is diamond, one of the hardest substances known. Notice that there are not distinct molecules in this type of solid and that the covalent bonding extends from one side of the solid to the other. A diamond is, in a sense, a single molecule. Of course, sp3 is not the only hybridization that allows carbon to bond to itself. sp2 hybridization can extend uh, endlessly in two dimensions, giving us graphite. Why does pencil lead rub off on paper so well? Well, because the layers of graphite, extremely strong within the layers, can slide off of one another. The layers are only held together with London dispersion forces. Wrap one of those graphite layers back onto itself into a cylinder, and you get a carbon nanotube, which is possibly the strongest fiber that can ever be made. Take one of the graphite layers by itself, and you have graphene. You can also make network solids with silicon dioxide, boron nitride, silicon carbide, and several other elements or combinations. All of these materials tend to be extremely mechanically strong and robust. Their melting points aren't really melting points in the same sense as for other solids, because melting these substances involves breaking covalent bonds.